This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Who and what are you? What is your philosophy of selfhood? How do you think about yourself? There's a wide range of choices. The philosopher Bertrand Russell said, man is but a helpless atom. The existentialist John Paul Sartre wrote, man is the incommensurable idiot of the universe. And the author H.L. Mencken described man as, quote, a sick fly taking a dizzy ride on a huge whirling flywheel. But then there was Jesus of Nazareth, who declared human beings are sons and daughters of God children of the divine with sparks of infinity indwelling their souls and that definition rings and resonates with truth unforgettably it reverberates within the mind and calls every person to a height for which he yearns within faith transforms life every aspect of it everybody has problems of some sort or another one man said he had so many troubles that if anything bad happened to him today it'd be two weeks before he could worry about it some say if it weren't for bad luck, they wouldn't have any luck at all. But what is the secret of dealing with difficulties? Jesus of Nazareth taught the principle, first of all, of refusing to worry about problems. Fear not, he said. Be not anxious. Refuse to make yourself a nervous wreck by stewing over difficulties. Secondly, Jesus taught seeking the will and wisdom of God in solving difficulties. In the Lord's Prayer, he taught his apostles to pray, Your will be done. But note the last word, done. Jesus did not merely say, your will be contemplated, or your will be admired, your will be praised, but your will be done, which is the third principle he taught in the solving of a problem. First, refuse to worry, have faith in God. Secondly, seek the will and wisdom of God. Then third, act in accordance with that will and wisdom. Jesus once said, blessed is the man who hears the word of God and obeys it and does it. Decision must eventuate in action. And by bearing in your mind these three principles of spiritual problem solving, you can begin to deal with your difficulties in a more vigorous and successful manner. Jesus did not teach the fatherhood of God alone. Not simply that people are supposed to bask in the bliss of knowing God without applying that love in every conceivable aspect of human life. He taught the fatherhood of God conjoined with the brotherhood of man. One little boy asked his Sunday school teacher why we're here on earth. The teacher replied, we're here on earth to help others. To which the boy replied, then what are the others here for? For the very same purpose, curiously enough, to help others. Love is the highest reason for human life. Jesus summarized it in his two great commandments, the love of God and the love of others, which he said encapsulated all of the law and the prophets to know first that God loves you infinitely. And then to begin to love other people with this warm, incredible love yourself. That is the genesis of joy. It is the initiation of a new way of life and a new outlook on life. It is to come alive to the real reason for being alive. There is a purpose in your human existence. Life is not just an endless struggle to keep your money coming in and your teeth and your hair from coming out with no higher purpose than that. Life is not just doing some work to buy some food to get some strength to do some work to make some money to buy some food to get some strength to do some more work to make some more money and so on there is in truth and in fact a high transcendent reason and purpose for your being alive and if you will quest it with all of your soul you will find it there's an eternal purpose for you a purpose which will sustain you and enliven you and intrigue you and thrill you endlessly if you will choose to seek it, find it, and do it. The will of God for you is not a dull daydream. It is a living adventure. God has exploits for you to undertake, but the choice is entirely yours whether to undertake them. There are many people who theoretically will say they believe in the brotherhood of man, and it is good that they do believe that even theoretically, but the brotherhood of man is not the entire totality of what Jesus was teaching. There was a man out for a drive with his wife one weekend, he stopped at a busy corner, but he was unable clearly to see to his right, so he asked his wife if there were any cars coming from the right, and she said no. And then as he was pulling out into the intersection, she said, but there is a truck. One half of the truth may be quite true, to be sure, 
But it is not the whole truth, the entirety of the picture. The brotherhood of man is true, but it does not encompass all there is to be said on the subject. The rest of the story is the fatherhood of God, the fact that all humankind are infinitely loved by one infinite God who is the creator and sustainer of all reality, who loves every human being with a love which will not let us go. Real religion is not an idle daydream. It is a dynamic activity. Jesus of Nazareth himself both taught and lived an active sort of life. He was a worker. He taught that the will of God is not only an ideal to be held, but a work to be done. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And if you will seek it in persistence, you will find it in power and begin to live as you were born to live, as a son or daughter of the Most High God. And this transformation of inner attitude will touch and influence every aspect of life. It is a scientifically established fact that the more optimistic and hopefully happy your state of mind is, the more immune you tend to be to contagious ailments. It's true. Medical studies at the University of Rochester School of Medicine indicate that among patients with a wide spectrum of diseases, in almost every case, unhappy emotional experiences were related to the onset of the ailment. Conversely, scientific studies at the State University of New York demonstrate that your human biochemical defense mechanisms against disease operate most efficiently when you're optimistic, happy, and hopeful. A veritable mountain of medical evidence now proves the connection between your moods, attitudes, outlook, philosophy, and religion, and the literal condition of your bodily health. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus of Nazareth said, be of good cheer, fear not, be not anxious, he was not expounding just sound philosophy and sound religion, but sound medicine as well. If these recent scientific findings are any indication, human beings were literally created for faith, not for fear, because it has been conclusively established we function better when we're living in faith than living fearfully. The ancient Greeks believed in this connection between the mental and the physical. For instance, history records that in those days a husband would sometimes be seen feeling his wife's pulse beat during a conversation. If he had any suspicion that she might be lying, the Greeks had observed that the heartbeat rate tends to increase when a person is not telling the truth. The connection between mental and bodily states has thus long been suspected. But only in recent decades has it been demonstrated conclusively. The total organism, you as an entire person, were created to function at your optimum, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, when living by the very highest of ideals, by truth, beauty, goodness, and in love for God and love for others. Jesus of Nazareth symbolized this when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Totally. Emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically. It means giving yourself wholeheartedly to the God whose son or daughter you are. As someone once put it, you may decide God doesn't exist. But just be glad God didn't decide you don't exist. Because God is the source and center of all reality, the origin of all existence, the universal father of every person on this planet, and God loves you boundlessly. This very instant, you didn't have to earn that. You don't have to do anything to get that. It's a fact. It's a truth. God loves you. And to let that love by faith fill and surge and soar within your soul will be the beginning of a new way of life for you, starting this instant, if you'll dare to believe it, this instant. To realize this truth as a personal experience will transform your life and will transform the way you live your life. Consider what John Wesley wrote on the living of a great life. He said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, and all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Do that and both you and this world will be very much different than they are. Radio listeners to this broadcast around the world have for years been writing to us with their questions and spiritual problems, and one of the most frequently encountered ones is this. How can I find and know and do the will of God? How can I let God guide my life? The first issue is to decide, wholeheartedly to decide, that you want to do the will of God. Ask God for a knowledge of that will and ask God to steer your life. But then remember, you can't steer a bicycle unless it's moving. Neither can the God of this universe, in all God's infinite power, steer your life 
unless it's moving. You can't drive a car in neutral. You have to put it into gear. Avoid the dead center of indecisiveness. God can only direct a life that's moving, that's active, that's doing the things at hand. Jesus' two great commandments were the love of God and the love of others. Begin loving God and loving people. Help people. Do things for them. Begin being good to them. Get moving. You can't steer a bicycle unless it's moving, and God can't steer your life unless you're willing to move. Set about loving people. Pray daily for guidance, and that guidance will surely come. God can only guide someone who's willing to act, and there's magnificent satisfaction in that. Begin now, not at some distant future time. Don't wait till you think all your problems have been solved before you begin to act. If you insisted that it be proved to your satisfaction that you would never have a flat tire on your summer vacation, that it would never rain during your trip, that there would be no detours on the highway. If you insisted on all these conditions before you began your trip, you would never begin your trip. And if you insist that all your intellectual questionings be answered about the spiritual life, about religion, about God, about prayer and guidance, if you insist that all your uncertainties be resolved before you begin to live as you were born to live, as a child of God, you will quite simply never begin to live that way. Living vitally is a matter of faith. It is daring to begin now by acting now, by giving your life to the living God who gave you your life in the first place and beginning now to live in love for God and love for others. And the moment you begin to do that, you have begun to live a way of life which will never have an end. You have set your foot that moment on the pathway to eternity. When you begin to live by eternal values, truth, beauty, goodness, and in the quest for perfection. For Jesus said, be you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Jesus said, be not content merely to lay up treasure or wealth on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But he said, lay up treasure in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Somebody on a university campus asked me one time, if God is love, why isn't it also true to say that love is God? I said that's like saying grass is green, so therefore everything which is green is grass, which is absurd. There are green automobiles, caterpillars, all sorts of things. God is love, but love is not God. But whether or not you understand that, you can know this love of God, you can feel it, you can experience it, and you can be a conduit a vessel, a channel of that love of God into the lives of other human beings. And to live in love for God and for others is very simply the greatest way possible that it's possible to live. You were born and created for that. And you can enter that new way of life by faith this very instant. The choice is yours for the making. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.